Um, hello, everybody. In case there's anybody logged on who I have not met, um, I'm Megan Carney. I coordinate the Fellows Program here at the University of New Hampshire. Um, so on behalf of the Fellows Program and the Social Innovation Internship Program, um, we're excited to welcome you to our second alumni panel webinar. Last week, we were fortunate to hear from some of our partners and alumni who work in the renewable energy field. And one thing that struck me from their stories was that um, none of them would have imagined being where they are now, doing what they do now when they were in your seats, when they were students or recent graduates and fellows and interns. Um, this field is evolving so quickly that it's not really about setting your sights on the job that you want 10 or 15 years from now and figuring out how to get there, but it's all about using your network to explore opportunities, to use your skills, to build your skills, to learn about the things that interest you and the things that don't interest you, um, and to contribute to work that you find important and meaningful. And it's entirely possible, in fact, likely, that you won't get to do all of those things at one time in one job. And that's what makes these stories so interesting. Um, so today we're gonna hear some more stories. And these are from alum alumni who work in the field of community development. Um, and again, we wanna put this conversation into the context of sustainable development goals. So we're gonna show you a short video on goal number 11, which is to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Um, something that I think is really at the forefront of all of our minds right now. So Faina, if you would show the video, that'd be great. Cities generate over 75% of the world's wealth. This attracts lots of people looking for a better future. But more people need more housing. Lack of affordable housing means that living in slums is often the only alternative. There is now an increased need for basic services. These services are often expensive and don't work well. The consequence? Diseases and epidemics become the norm. People need to earn a living. If they can't find regular jobs in their city, they will look for money somewhere else. Informal economies boom, as do illegal activities. Many cities currently follow traditional urban planning with strict zoning. Residential over here, industries over there, commercial in the middle, more residential suburbs all around. The result is urban sprawl. Cities get wide. And wide means that people need to travel longer distances. How do they travel? Mostly by car. This results in huge jams. This slows down not only traffic, but also the city's economy. Cities are big polluters. They account for as much as 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions, the main cause of climate change. As a result, natural disasters and storms test the resilience of our cities more than ever. Loss of lives, destroyed property, and economic downturn are a global problem. In the face of all this, cities need to rethink themselves. Cities need to have a holistic, all-inclusive approach to their development so as to accommodate more people and provide equal opportunities for all. So what is a city that works? Cities need to get their street grid right with sufficient intersections to ease traffic flow, enhance access and interconnect the city. Cities need to embrace mixed land use, become more compact, blending residences, offices, shops, amenities. This cuts the need for long commutes. Cities also need to get their social mix right, promoting neighbourhoods with a variety of housing types for all budgets. Well-planned cities increase their job numbers by 15% by being just that, well-planned. But cities need to look beyond this, providing the right incentives for the economic sector to strive and focusing on providing jobs to the urban poor. Slums need to be upgraded and connected to the city, not only in terms of mobility, but also socially, to create a strong overall social tissue and foster inclusivity. Universal access to basic services is paramount. Cities also need to provide enough land for public spaces, at least 30% of their footprint. Public spaces are vital for social exchange. They are spaces for leisure, fitness and culture, and where citizens interact. Cities need to free themselves from the dominance of cars by setting up attractive, affordable public transport systems and promoting non-motorized mobility such as walking and cycling. That will not only reduce congestion, but also help to curb pollution. Cities need to become greener to help alleviate the effects of climate change and provide a clean environment for their citizens. At the same time, cities need to become resilient to the increasing adverse effects of climate change. All this makes for a happy city.
Thanks, Megan. Um, so hi, everyone. And I am Faina Bucher. I'm the program director for the Changemaker Collaborative, formerly the Center for Social Innovation and Enterprise. Um, and I oversee the Social Innovation Internship Program. So I'm really stoked today to introduce our moderator, Paul Bradley. He's a 1986 UNH alumnus who graduated with his bachelor's degree in economics. I first learned about Paul in 2013 when he was honored as the Social Innovator of the Year at UNH. Paul was presented this award because he was recognized as a bold leader who consistently demonstrated his commitment to combine the passion and purpose of social, economic, and environmental change with the rigor and accountability of market-based approaches in designing and growing a national social business. Paul is the founding president of Rock USA and has been since 2008. So Rock USA is a nonprofit social venture, which has scaled resident, own, um, resident ownership of manufactured home communities, or what some of you may know as mobile home parks. In other words, Rock USA helps residents of these communities come together to buy their manufactured home communities from private community owners. Together with the Rock USA Network, which is a group of nine regional nonprofit affiliates and Rock USA Capital, a community development financial institution lending subsidiary. They work with 250 resident owned communities in 16 states, helping thousands upon thousands of people by educating and supporting them through a very complex and daunting financing and operations process, all resulting in a secure and affordable place to live for themselves and for their families with greater financial returns upon selling their properties. Paul has been a longtime partner of UNH, speaking regularly at UNH classes, and has hosted many summer social innovation interns in the past 10 years, including Naomi, who you'll hear from today also. Paul, in case I haven't made it very clear yet, I couldn't be more thrilled to have you here with us today. I hand the webinar over to you. Thank you, Faina, and thank you and Megan for the invitation to participate today. It is a real pleasure, and I can't think of a better topic uh, at this point in time, given uh, COVID-19 and the global pandemic, uh, in addition to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, the, the racial inequities uh, and, and fundamental problems that we have uh, around justice uh, for, for that, that community and for all of us. Um, you know, uh, I've been asked to comment a little bit on the grand challenges and opportunities for young professionals in the field of community development, and I can, can uh, put it this way. You know, I am uh, always thrilled to be on campus and now uh, interacting online with students of your generation because it gives me great hope that uh, some of these long-standing challenges, problems can actually be uh, uh, solved or at least advanced, uh, you know, in this next generation. The um, pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement has really highlighted for low-income communities and communities of color the significant problems that we have with the wealth gap and opportunity gap in the United States and really around the world. Um, and I think the dual challenge for uh, young professionals and for everyone in the field of community development is how, how do we advance change? How do we advance solutions that are both community-based? Because community-based solutions are what last uh, and what are informed by the people who are actually involved in the, the challenge, uh, but that are also scalable. And this is where your educations are so important as you think about solutions. How do you scale those solutions? Because quite frankly, the nonprofit sector in my career has really not sufficiently stepped up to address in scalable ways the fundamental problems that low-income communities and communities of color face. Um, and, uh, and, and you step into the professional world seeing that and uh, have, a, have a real opportunity to advance it. And I do think that's the dual challenge. You know, this will sound funny, but I, I 
uh, became active uh, and really focused on cooperative development at UNH uh, during the Reagan administration, where the wealth gap was expanding. And I thought it was a I thought it was troubling then, uh, but it's almost laughable because the wealth gap has only exploded uh, in the last uh, 30 plus years. So uh, that's the dual challenge. How do we address fundamental uh, injustices and the lack of opportunity and the widening wealth gap in communities through community-based solutions, yet scalable, not just simple local solutions because we need solutions uh, uh, greater solutions and faster. So um, those that's uh, from a from a, a fairly high level, but I think that's the overriding challenge. I think I'm really excited to hear from some young professionals who are taking on these very challenges in various communities around the country, and so I'm excited to to hand it over to uh, Naomi Guzman, who is the development manager for the Fulbright Association. Uh, and Naomi, welcome and please jump right in. Thanks, Paul. Um, so my name is Naomi and I'm the development manager at the Fulbright Association. The Fulbright Association is the alumni organization for the Fulbright Program. And the Fulbright Program is an international exchange program where um, people from countries across the world do research or teach English as a second language in another country. Um, for a year and kind of get fully immersed into that community and that culture and get to learn its ins and outs. And um, generally the time that people go on Fulbrights is right after they graduate college um, or if they're an academic, they will probably go um, sometime during their studies or career. Uh, the mission of the program is to see um, international exchange as a force for creating world peace. And so it's um, really delving into the concept that if we had a world um, where everyone was understanding each other across cultures and a world of friendship, um, that we would be able to tackle some of our bigger problems that we have as a society. Um, so I am fairly new to the organization. I've been working with them for about six months now. Um, and as their development manager, I am the primary person responsible for cultivating all of their funds. Um, which means anything from sponsorships to grants, um, but mostly working with our donors. And I have to say the thought of bringing in money or asking people for money has definitely um, been something that on its face doesn't sound like something I would be interested in doing. Um, but I've come to see development as being a lot more than just asking people for money. Um, when I graduated from UNH, I worked for the New Hampshire Women's Foundation, where I first got to kind of see the ins and outs of what development meant. And a lot of it is just getting to know people, getting to know your community, and building a community of people who want to create the same kind of world you do. And so amongst a variety of issues, I've worked for a lot of women's organizations. And so this is my first international org. Um, I've really been able to see how being a donor is one way to ensure that people at a nonprofit organization are working around the clock to see the world you want to create, um, even if you can't be doing that work personally, and to invest in the community, whether it's an interpersonal level or whether it's at a systemic level where they're hiring lobbyists and working at the state house. Um, so development is definitely an expansive field and one that I think takes a lot of heart and a lot of research. Um, so that's something that's been important to me. Um, when I was interning at Rock USA, I was tasked to build websites for the resident-owned communities to kind of highlight what was fantastic about their community so that they could use it to advertise it to potential manufactured homeowners who might want to move into a given community. Um, and the website building process was pretty user-friendly, but what I really appreciated about it was the opportunity to connect with board members and to get to talk to them about why they love the place they loved, you know, share pictures with me, um, and to really listen to them telling their stories, and then to be the person tasked with trying to communicate their story in a way that it would be advertised to the world. And I think that um, something that has helped me a lot throughout my career is taking an opportunity and figuring out what you like about it, um, what you don't like about it, and what you really want to see present in your next job. And that piece of working in community with other people to hear their stories and kind of figure out how we could use that to work towards change has been a huge driving force in everything I've done since. So thank you. Thanks. 
Wonderful, Naomi. Thank you so much. And uh, we are going to take questions in the chat. So feel free to ask questions. We are going to hold them till the end, though, uh, and, uh, and proceed with our panelists. So um, happy to introduce Kelly Flicka, who's a resiliency specialist with FEMA. Kelly, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here with you today. Um, I think for me, the uh, fellowship that the opportunity that I had is just was such a um, it just sort of set me on my career path and trajectory. I think in general, you know, the topic of community development and planning, I've always been interested in people and places. Um, but it sort of took me a while to find this field and even, um, you know, planning is a very diverse field, very different, um, depending upon the different scales that you're working at. Um, but when my fellowship opportunity, you know, came available, which was focused around looking at socially vulnerable populations to the impact of climate change, working with a partner in New Jersey, who was really leading on um, those initiatives because at the time there wasn't support for talking about climate change at the state level. Um, that research um, and that experience and the in-depth um, time that you can take with a specific subject was just so helpful to me. Um, it set me down my path in terms of working on resiliency and hazard mitigation. Um, I can link every single job from the fellowship um, to that experience um, where I had interviewers, you know, say that they were really interested in the, the expertise I was able to generate. I think fellowships are just so special in that sense that you really get to dedicate on your time on one topic rather than being pulled in a lot of different um, directions. Um, I should say, maybe but I should have started with this, that sort of this is me giving you my perspective on, on my career and experience and not necessarily speaking on behalf of my agency. Um, I think as a government employee, we often just have to be careful about that. Um, but yeah, after completing my fellowship, I was able to work in hazard mitigation planning and resiliency planning, uh, both at the county, um, and state levels, working with local communities, um, and then was able to transition into my current position in FEMA as a resiliency specialist, which, um, you know, resilience is really broad, um, not well defined, um, or can mean a lot of different things to different people. And essentially, my work at Region 2 is to explore what that means specifically um, to our agency and our stakeholders. Um, it's a new position. Uh, there's only a handful uh, of similar positions um, in the country so far. Um, and I've just really been working to both work internally to build uh, resilience, but also work externally. And I would say that um, what I've learned in school and the topic area experience has been important. I think I found in this role, those soft skills have been um, super critical. So building relationships, um, with individuals, really taking the time to um, learn the expertise that everyone brings to the table and uh, build trust um, to try to work together and move things um, forward. And if you're not familiar with FEMA, our mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters. I was interested in working with the agency because um, working in the resiliency, climate adaptation, hazard mitigation space, I felt that um, the agency played such a big role in helping communities um, come back and um, also invest before uh, disasters to make them more resilient and sustainable. Um, and so I just wanted to get experience in this space um, and was really excited when the opportunity presented itself. So. Um, that's just a little bit about me. Thank you. Great, Kelly. Thank you. And our last panelist is uh, Andrea Webster from Indiana State University, Indiana University, pardon me, <laughs> uh, in the Environmental Resiliency Institute. So, Andrea. All right. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, I mean, I completely agree with Kelly that this, the fellowship that I had through UNH uh, was a really pivotal 
moment for me because it allowed me tra to transition from doing sustainability work at colleges and universities to in the to working with municipalities, which is what I found I really enjoy. Um, I got started in this work. Uh, I actually did my undergraduate at Indiana University here in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, I got a French degree and I graduated before the 2008 recession and I got a job working for ACHI, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education with, with a French degree, which, uh, you know, I'd been doing sustainability work and volunteering on campus. Uh, and so they, you know, they saw some potential in me and hired me and it was really or early on in the organization. So I was really, really lucky in that way. Um, I spent three years there and quickly learned that if I was going to do anything with this field, I really needed a degree, especially because the economy had crashed by that time. Uh, and so I sought out a um, joint degree in public administration and environmental sciences uh, from uh, the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, uh, just next door to you all, uh, and, um, and the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. So um, I, I really appreciated that degree um, while I was there and afterwards because uh, it really, especially the Masters of Public Administration, really forced me to develop some technical skills and some quantitative skills that I was able to use at jobs afterwards. And specifically, you know, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of us that are trained in sustainability and we know about environmental issues, but to have, I think like, one of the reasons why I've, I mean, among many reasons, uh, you know, but I think one of the reasons it's really helped me get some of the jobs I've gotten so far is for me to be able to say, yeah, I'm trained in sustainability, but I'm also trained in all these extra skills. Uh, because, you know, nonprofits and other local governments are just scraping by and the more talent you can bring to that organization, whether it's website skills or um, quantitative analysis or whatever, it may, or marketing or whatever it may be, has, I mean, it's been really helpful for me. So um, I, I completed the, a fellowship with uh, the city of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, doing a greenhouse gas inventory right out of, um, right out of graduate school. And um, so I, I had taken a greenhouse gas inventory course in graduate school where we did part of a municipal inventory, but I was able to really do one full on uh, for the city of Portsmouth. And you know, that was my first time actually working for a city government. And from there I was trying, I headed back to the Midwest and I got a job working for the city of Louisville, uh, for Louisville Metro government. And their newly formed sustainability office at the time. And, um, you know, we, I, my job there was primarily just to implement the city's sustainability plan. So we did a lot of urban heat work. We did, uh, we, we tried as best as we could to push on climate work. Um, and we got a couple things started there. It was, you know, it was such a fun job just to be able to work in a city and try to work with the community members and, and get things started in our office, but also in the community up and going. Uh, it's challenging work. It's really challenging work because of the politics and the uh, funding resources and um, and you know everything else that goes into doing sustainability work in a city government. But I found the challenge really invigorating. It's every win that you get, even if it's small, really counts for a lot, and you can really feel like you're making a difference. Um, now I uh, I stayed in Louisville for about four years, uh, and I I guess two and a half or three years ago I started with Indiana University. Um, so in in this position, my title is implementation manager. Um, and but my day-to-day -day job is uh, working with local governments across the state of Indiana and around the Midwest, but but mostly in Indiana, and um, and so I'm working with all of them to help them with their climate resilience projects and their sustainability projects to try to get that up and going. I mean, most most cities in Indiana and most towns and counties don't have sustainability staff, and so they're relying on our office to provide some expertise and give them, like hold their hand just enough to get this stuff going. So it's, it's been really fun. I think one of my favorite projects is our resilience cohort. So this is a project that uh, I started um, because of the fellowship I had with UNH. Um, so I created a, so Indiana University has a fellowship program, just like UNH does uh, for sustainability internships around across the state of Indiana. And so um, I created this resilience cohort program in which I have cities um, in year one doing greenhouse gas inventories and in year two doing climate action plans. And so, in, in, and then those cities sign up to do that work. And then I, 
partner with the Campus Sustainability Office's fellowship program and place students with those cities to help them do that work. So these students, Indiana University, despite our efforts so far, does not have a greenhouse gas inventory course. So this is the only place they have to learn to do that work is on the job training. Uh, and they've loved it. And, you know, they have a chance to practice their technical skills. And, um, and you know, before the program started, there were two cities in Indiana that had ever done a, green, a community wide greenhouse gas inventory. And now we have, um, I think 16 or 17 now that have completed inventories, which covers over 35% of the state's population. So we're really pleased with that progress. And that's just in a year and a half. So it, um, it's really incredible by just adding some capacity to local governments um, and some motivated students uh, and some you know, hand-holding from uh, a reliable university within the state. Uh, it's been really, it's a really fun job and I enjoy it a lot. Uh, and then I guess I'll, the last thing I'll mention is that um, in addition to the kind of greenhouse gas uh, reduction side of my work. The other side is um, preparing the state for environmental change. So I work for this Environmental Resilience Institute at the university and their main mission is to prepare the state for climate change. And so um, it's a, a large part of my job is really focused on communication. And so uh, we develop resources to help communities understand exactly how they're going to be impacted by climate change. Uh, we are lucky enough in the state of Indiana to have a downscaled climate projections for that are specific to the state. And so um, I worked with a team of people to develop a website called the Hoosier Resilience Index that provides downscaled climate data for every city, town, and county in the state of Indiana. So when I worked for the city of Louisville, um, my administration would say, oh, well, the National Climate Assessment's Southeast projections, I mean, that's not for Louisville because Louisville's on the north side of that. And like, that's, that's not good enough for us to make decisions on. And so, you know, now we have this tool that's, well, it's for your specific city and these are the projections that scientists from right here in our state are telling us. So we need to listen to these and it's, it's a much more convincing argument. I mean, I think um, in Indiana, the local governments are, uh, you know, they're, they're small towns. And, and so they're not going to be paying attention to what's going on in large cities across the country. And so I think they're really happy to have a local university to turn to, to um, guide them through some projects that work for them. So it's a fun, fun job. Uh, and I guess I'll leave it there for now. I'd love to hear what questions you all have. Great. We do have uh, we do have a couple questions rolling in. Please uh, continue to, to add questions. I, uh, I'll have a moderator's prerogative though and start with a question for each of you. Uh, you've had uh, job transitions in your careers and so I'm very interested how each of you has leveraged uh, your networks uh, in terms of identifying new opportunities and, and closing on those opportunities. Naomi, how have you leveraged some of your networks? Sure, um, so my first job at the New Hampshire Women's Foundation was something um, that the opportunity kind of came to me from an internship I had with the um, New Hampshire Women's Initiative. Um, so it was kind of looking at the people I was already in conversation with and letting them know that I was looking for a job and having an updated resume. Um, but I think the most telling um, networking opportunity that I had was when I made the transition moving from New Hampshire to South Carolina where I didn't know anyone. Um, and so that was really hard because there was really no one off of in that community that I could kind of bounce ideas off of or anyone that I knew who knew someone who lived there. Um, so before I moved, I just started sending emails to people who worked for organizations that I was interested in and said, hey, I'm going to be new to your town in about six months. And um, I'd love to set up a phone call to kind of talk to you about the issues that you're seeing in your area and, and what you're doing to address those. And so I just kind of started making contacts by showing interest and adding value and having consistent and good follow-up. And ultimately, um, that made it really easy to get to know the community. So when I moved there, I already had a list of eight people I could have lunch with and say hello to. So I think even if you don't have contacts now, um, being enthusiastic, being respectful of people's time, and having clear and consistent follow-up, you can make the kind of contacts you want to make in a lot of different fields. Wow, what a great story. 
the uh, that that sort of takes the informational interview of my era to uh, to uh, email forum here. Fantastic, Naomi. Thank you, Kelly. How about you? What uh, how did you leverage your networks? Yeah, I think um, it was a a tough learning process for me um, in the sense that you know after I finished grad school, um, I was also um in the process of transitioning uh, in my relationship as well i was about to get married um my uh boyfriend husband now at the time was um also looking at, in a transition period so we were really open to working you know anywhere in the us and so i was sending job applications that looked interesting all over the country and um i think i learned um painfully so in a slow process that really your network is so huge and particularly when you're transitioning from university to um you know that first job after school um i think your network plays a huge part in sort of opening that first door um i think also between transitions so between um jobs rely using my network to have like I've done some small consulting um, projects in between um, positions, even if that gap was only two months or so, um, just to stay, stay employed, stay working, get different types of experience. Um, I think that's how sort of my network has helped um, contribute. And then also just generally, you know, sending, and I do this with my own network. If I see positions that I think um, folks will be interested in or I know they're looking, I just, I send them um, on because I was in that same position. Um, and then lastly, I think just having, I have a few key people who I see as mentors that I look up to um, that also have really broad networks. And I don't engage them, you know, just when I'm looking, I engage them, um, in an ongoing fashion to get, you know, guidance or um, feedback and, and moral support and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think your network network is huge and you shouldn't underestimate that. Great, Kelly. Just um, interested, you pick up some small consulting work along the way to patch things together and keep yourself active professionally. Any tips for any uh, participants on picking up small projects uh, within areas of interest and expertise? Yeah, I mean, um, my work in that space um, was involved with um, a university. It was actually an extenuation, uh, extension of my fellowship research. It was to update uh, the analysis I had done. So that was a university partner. And then the two other positions were consulting firms that essentially needed someone to help on a project, whether it was through um, designing site plans or an, a research project, you know, looking at a specific um, business line that they want, that they were thinking about pursuing. Um, and it was very similar to my experience as a fellow. So working independently, being very self-driven, um, producing specific, you know, deliverables and utilizing time management and things like that. So um, I learned of those opportunities by just talking to my network about, um, you know, <laughs> looking um, for opportunities. Um, and I think, yeah, people just suggested that, you know, they had something available, so. Yeah. Well, and having an expansive view of, of opportunities, uh, not thinking uh, full-time employment only, but maybe there are some, some smaller opportunities where you can gain traction in, uh, in, in a field. Yeah, great, Kelly. Thank you. Andrea, how about you? How have you leveraged networks in building your career? Well, um, I mean, I think, you know, as both Naomi and Kelly were saying, just kind of telling all of your, all the people you've ever worked with before uh, about the transition that you're making and that you, or that you want to make and uh, see what connections they have. I think you'll find that and I've always found that people in the field of sustainability are incredibly helpful and they just, they want to help their peers and we want to see us succeed within this, you know, challenge of climate change. So um, if, if, you know, if you've already been doing some sustainability or climate work and we can keep you in that field and, um, and keep you uh, 
growing intellectually and, and keep you challenged as you're doing that work uh, and interested, then everybody wants to help. So, um, so I found that to be really nice. And the other thing I'll say is that's helped me is being open with my bosses about the fact that I'm looking for a new job. Uh, this can be a hard thing to do because your boss never wants to hear that you're leaving because having a staff person that leaves is inevitably more work for them. But um, you'll get over that blow and then they'll be really helpful and want to see you succeed. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> Once they pick themselves up off the floor. Okay, <laughs> yeah. great. So um, in, as opposed to me trying to interpret your questions and get it just right, I'm gonna go ahead and call on those who've uh, submitted questions. And the first would be uh, uh, Anu, I think, uh, A-N-U, Anu. Yeah, Anu, yes. Wonderful, would you like to ask your question of the group and we'll see who picks up Yeah, um, my question is, I'm just wondering, to any that it applies to what the difference you think is working in a government, it could be local, state or federal, or working in an NGO and how much this effect has on the community and how much you've seen. Anybody, want anybody jump right in. Sure, um, I think that so I've never worked for government um, organizations, but I have worked for organizations that were funded by government grants. Um, and I think the funding model of the organization can make a huge difference because your organization is always kind of like beholden to someone. You're always kind of responsible um, for pushing initiatives forward and someone is expecting something from you. So I think with government organizations, there can be a lot of like red tape, a lot of restrictions. Um, but if you're looking at nonprofit organizations, you're also working within the framework of you have to fundraise, um, you have to write grants. So it can be pretty demanding to bring in those funds, but I think it can give you a lot of flexibility. That being said, there are certain rules about like how partisan you can be and the things that you can say, whether you're in either space. Um, so I've never worked for a nonprofit that wasn't bipartisan or nonpartisan. Um, and I've worked like at nonprofits that have worked exclusively on or primarily on political issues. So I think it's important to keep in mind that regardless what you're looking at, there might be more, you know, grant reports if you're getting government money, or there might be more red tape if you're working for a government agency. There's always kind of going to be something. So I think both have merit and you have to see um, what's more important to you. Because I, I do think um, nonprofit organizations can get stuck in a situation where now you have major donors who have large amounts of money and they have expectations for the kinds of things that your organization will do. Um, but I think with a, a nonprofit, you do have a little bit more flexibility if you have a large pool of individuals who are at the core of your funding. Great, other views on different sectors? Yeah, I can comment on this. I mean, I've jumped back and forth a little bit between government work and nonprofits. And um, I mean, I think it's it's sort of like, you know, and this is all early career work, but some of the things I've noticed is that uh, when I like just on a work-life balance issue, I mean, I think I had better work-life balance when I worked for a city government because they told me you're not allowed to work more than 40 hours a week and you can't have overtime. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of nice. And I think I stayed more refreshed uh, in, in my, in, and fresh in my work. But, um, but I think there's also implications between the two for creativity. I think both positions, uh, both sectors allow for creativity, but it's a different type of creativity. Um, I mean, I think there's a, depends on the government you work for, first of all, uh, that's in the administration that you're working under, that's gonna have a lot to do with it. Um, but I think, I think it's hard to say you know, from a broad sweeping perspective that, you know, one is better than the other because it, it really just depends on the organization and the, and the government. But um, I've, I've found value in both and, uh, and have enjoyed both. Uh, I think I like, I think I prefer working for city governments because of the diversity of people I get to work with. Uh, I think seeing civil servants that have just dedicated their careers to improving their communities uh, is really inspiring. Uh, but I also think that you can encounter people that um, 
just get stuck in their job and add no creativity or are not interested in new projects. Um, so, but you know, in nonprofits, people are also interested in, uh, people are definitely interested in new projects in, in nonprofits, but then that often ends up in a lot of extra work for you. So. And if I could just add, um, a few more perspectives. Um, I think getting experience in different sectors is really critical and it doesn't matter at what point in time, whether you go, you know, nonprofit, private, public, and whatever sequence, because at some point in your career, you're going to be engaging with people from different sectors and having an understanding of like what they're experiencing, I think makes you a better uh, partner on the team. Um, so for instance, I've had more experience in um, private sector and public sector work. Um, and so understanding that, you know, a lot of times governments contract out um, for projects, for instance, like planners or, and in a government role, you're overseeing entire programs and you're designing that and consultants are responding and providing services, you know, to the need that you've expressed. Um, I think having an understanding that um, everyone is working under, you know, strict budgets and timelines, I think is really important and not everybody um, who's been in the public sector has had private sector experience, so they don't always bring that consciousness to a meeting. <laughs> and I think it helped me um, have uh, empathy for, you know, the people I worked with who were on tight um, budgets and, and, and timelines to understand that. Um, I would just say I've personally really enjoyed working in, in the public sector. Obviously, um, it's everything everyone describes about it, um, but it's also, I think there's a lot of, in terms of red tape, and I think, though, that there's a lot of possibility um, to do that higher level sort of thinking, program design, um, and just work in the public interest and not have sort of that profit um, uh, motive or... Um, demand to, to have to meet that when you're doing a project. Like I can spend more time thinking about or researching or whatever and not have the pressure of, well, I only have, you know, X amount of hours left on this specific task that I can develop. Um, so I think that's sort of why I've enjoyed the public sector, but obviously any and all experience will be very um, beneficial to you in your career, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me um, touch on two things uh, Noemi brought up about uh, funding models really matter. And Kelly, you're really hitting on the value of, of distinct experience in, in one of the uh, varied experience in different sectors. My experience is in the nonprofit sector and in the for-profit sector. I've never worked for the public sector. Uh, and in the nonprofit sector, I've worked both in threadbare nonprofit organizations and I've worked at now in a sustainable social venture and uh, I've come to believe that sustainable social ventures are really important for delivering uh, impact at scale because you can't scale something that isn't sustainable and so um, uh, and, and what I've really enjoyed most recently as we've achieved uh, break-even performance is the ability then to begin directing resources into mission investments, uh, no, no, I mean, things that Naomi, things that we want to do because uh, we think it's the right thing to do, as opposed to well, that doesn't fit the RFP from ABC Foundation. Um, and uh, so, uh, so I've, I've particularly enjoyed our evolution into the social business or social venture um, part of the you know, what is effectively an evolving nonprofit sector now with, you know, many different economic and business models uh, that are really fun. And of course, UNH is right at the, right on, at the cutting edge of this uh, at the center, which I, which I celebrate and appreciate. Excellent. So uh, let's go to uh, Jake. Uh, Jake, I don't know if you have your microphone on, but you wanted to ask a question about climate resilience. Yes, thank you. Sorry to pivot from the career development no. stuff, but uh, I did have a question. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering who the key players are in funding climate resilience, specifically in community development. I'm doing a project right now in Vermont looking at um, climate adaptation spending across the board, um, any kind of resilience and adaptation spending. And one of the key buckets we're looking at is community development and um, in infrastructure. So 
I'm interested in just uh, maybe, you know, if you're familiar where the money's coming from, maybe if it's, you've seen that it's common for state spending from uh, tax dollars to be supporting those, or if utilities tend to take on um, those developments or yeah, any other parties. Well, that's a great question. And uh, boy, one can imagine it's a very dynamic situation right now and uh, quickly evolving. And, and I bet uh, it's going to change some uh, here in the coming months. Who would like to lend their experience on funding streams in the resilience, resiliency space? Kelly? I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, I will definitely admit I don't know um, all about resilience finance um, and who's funding, but I mean, the federal government certainly plays a large role um, in investing. Um, FEMA has a, a new program um, that's going to roll out later this year called BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure and in Communities. The idea is that um, essentially uh, we're trying to invest more money, you know, before disasters happen. Um, think about multi-beneficial solutions. Often the majority, and it, it's still the case that the majority of funding, federal funding flows, you know, after an event. Um, and it's to rebuild what was and not, you know, build better necessarily. Um, there are some exceptions to that. But um, the Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018 established um, a program where the BRIC program, which sets aside 6% of the prior year's disaster expenditures to mitigation funding. Um, whereas in the past, um, pre-disaster funding was reliant on congressional appropriation. So if you know Congress decided to not from the program or at different levels, you know, that was always um, up to change. And so this is really a shift um, for the agency that we have dedicated funding, um, obviously variable based on the disasters of the prior year, um, but to do that forward thinking um, and, and, and preventative action by taking, you know, mitigation um, and funding that those types of projects. Um, FEMA is not the only sort of funder in the space. Obviously, HUD is a big um, funder uh, in community development um, and also in disaster funding. Um, the Small Business Administration as well um, has loans. There's lots of things I think that are new that are happening in the um, private space, like green bonds and um, that's not even an area that I have a lot of expertise in, but um, one that's developing. I think your point, Paul, is well taken that, you know, with any of these funding mechanisms, um, even funding that comes, you know, from the federal government, there typically is a requirement for a local match. And I think with, you know, what we've seen with the economy and the impacts to local Budgets. I think that that's going to be um, challenging moving forward for locals and states to even meet potentially. I, I don't know. I haven't seen all of the numbers, but um, it could be a challenge moving forward that when communities are responding to the disaster of the day to justify investment in um, the longer uh, disaster that we've um, all talked about in terms of like climate change and um, and hazards. So. Um, yeah. I love hearing you say that, Kelly, because one of my talking points when I'm working with local governments is that FEMA is getting out of the disaster response business and more into the disaster resilience, like preparedness business. And so I, yeah. Yeah, I always say this still very, um, <laughs> I, I met my response colleagues um, during COVID-19 <laughs> to support the region's efforts on that. Um, definitely still a, a part of FEMA's mission. Um, but I just think the, there's been, a large disparity in funding outlay um, in terms of, of mitigation funding. So I would love to see um, even more dedicated funding in this space from FEMA, but also from you know other agencies and and that sort of shared responsibility with local governments um, as well. Yeah, and Jake, I'll add that um, there's uh, I'm seeing a lot of found more foundations step up to fund climate resilience work. Uh, and of course, it's, it's kind of happening, I mean, it's definitely happening at the national scale for the larger cities, 
But for the smaller cities, it's not happening. For the smaller communities, they, they don't really have access to that national funding source. So um, like, but so I, I would, I always encourage cities to turn to the local foundations if they have them, like even the community foundations are starting to fund some small scale resilience work. Uh, Cleveland, for example, um, their city sustainability office has done so much uh, compared to the rest of the cities in the Midwest because they have set like two or three very strong uh, climate foundations funding climate work. Um, I see some utilities funding cl climate and environmental work too. Uh, people feel um, have mixed feelings about accepting that money. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if, if you see, I've seen those pie charts. I mean, Naomi probably knows a lot more about this than I do, so I should shut up soon. But, um, but I've seen those pie charts where it's like, you know, like 70% of the funding that's donated is from private foundations, as opposed to like the federal government or other sources. So um, don't discount reaching out to those organizations or figuring out how to make those connections. Great, great. Well, we are going to be limited on time and I see questions now rolling in. So let's, let's rock and roll. Uh, Jacob, you have a question about uh, keeping your feet on the ground, but uh, are you able to ask your question? Yeah, I am. Thank you, Paul. Great. And thank all three of you for being here today. Um, my question is, when you're doing this type of high level systems planning work, how do you avoid getting lost in like, we need a plan for a report for the meeting for that thing? Um, and keep your feet on the ground and just make sure that what you're doing is making a difference in people's lives, because I've struggled with that in projects in the past. Um, so that's for all of you. And thank you. Sure. Um, I think a piece of like all of kind of like the administrative tasks that need to get done and the stuff, the reports that can get in your way also can be a huge way to hold you accountable to be focused on the task at hand. So um, I, I used to work for a domestic violence and sexual assault organization and we had to account every single hour of our time and our grant reports to the government and say, what I spent it on, why I spent it on that, what projects I did, what deliverables were met. And although it was very tedious and spent a lot of my time reporting out, it also, I was really grateful for that because I was able to see, okay, I gave, you know, 12 trainings this month to teach people about proper procedures for talking with survivors, or um, I spent 130 hours um, perfecting reports and, and looking at at different elements of how people are administering support. So I think that all of that stuff can get in the way sometimes, but it can also be a great way to hold you accountable to your deliverables so that when your mind is going everywhere, you have a clear pathway to kind of what you want to accomplish. So I think as much as it's a hindrance, it can also be an opportunity to be a roadmap in that way. Yeah, and I'll add that, I mean, developing reports is, really important, especially for transparency. Uh, but I've tried more and more in my career to not dwell as much on reports so I can spend more of my time um, accomplishing tasks and, uh, and implementing projects as much as I can. And I would just add um, taking joy in small wins. So if something does go well, like celebrate that, um, but also, not getting so lost in the minutia of the day or disappointments, um, but thinking about long-term goals and are you, is in the grand scheme of things, is what you're doing good? Is it contributing to moving forward in an area that you think is important? Um, I think in government, it can be very easy because things move extremely slowly. Um, to see uh, that light, <laughs> um, but I just try to break it down to uh, small wins and defining that in the ways that you know make sense to you, um, and just finding things that are tangible that say like you know I, I think this was and, and it, for me it could just be that you know people have decided to share information or work together or um, recognize that someone else's work is has utility and like we're going to partner with them. Um, I think it's just, you can't, you can't let all of the little disappointments or like challenges 
make you think that like with the, in the grand scheme, your work doesn't matter. No, it does matter. And all of us collectively working to improve, um, you know, where we can and, and make a difference in our little space. Um, I, I think that's what you have to hold on to. Yeah. Great. Great. Let's try to get uh, uh, Gabe's question in. Yeah, great. Uh, I know we're running a lot of time, but thanks. Um, my name's Gabe Desmond. I'm a sustainability fellow working for um, Middlebury College on um, biomass carbon accounting. And uh, my question is, um, if any of you have advice in terms of um, breaking into cities and communities that you're not initially a part of, it's not where you grew up or where you went to school. Um, I think a lot of community works, like for good reason, tend to hire people from that community or from that city. And um, just if any of you have advice of, I think, um, yeah, Getting, getting work in communities that you're not um, directly a part of. Thank you. So I do this all the time. Um, cold calling is really hard and it uh, can be effective sometimes. And sometimes people just appreciate that you're thinking about them. Uh, outside of the COVID world, going in person to visit them means a lot. I mean, so much. And that's where I've created the majority of my connections across the state of Indiana. Right. And then finally, um, having use your network, try to find somebody who knows somebody even just vaguely to introduce you. Great. LinkedIn is a very powerful tool. Naomi probably uses it in fundraising. Very powerful tool for finding out who knows who and how to get to the people you want to get to on Andrea's advice, LinkedIn. Naomi, did you want to respond to that quickly? Yeah, and then we're going I was to also going to gonna say, um, I think that nobody really writes handwritten notes anymore. And I know this sounds incredibly like, I don't know, something that someone wouldn't do, but I find that almost any time I take the time to write an appeal to someone that is thoughtful, that is personal, that says I know a little bit about them, um, I almost always get a response, even if it's just to say, I noticed you did your Fulbright in you know, this year and my executive director spoke highly about that program and, and I've heard you know, you know this person and, and they've been really essential to our community. Um, there's something really warm and unusual about those sorts of communications. So anytime you can follow up or start a relationship with a handwritten note or a personal phone call and acknowledge that people are busy and so they don't have endless time to talk to you, but that talking to them would be a privilege. I think coming with that humility, people really respond, so. Excellent. Excellent, great. Let's get uh, Rita. I think uh, you had a question, if we can get you in last really quickly, and then we'll finish up. I'll ask quickly. So my name is Britta. I'm working with um, Timberland and the Smallholder Farmers Alliance this summer. And my question was, I guess Andrew would probably be best to answer this, but how um, does local politics affect um, towns' willingness to participate in these environmental resilience programs? Or is it more like a town's access to financial capital that like determines whether or not they want to participate? Uh, well, both count for a lot. Um, we've tried to make our programs, because we're a university, we make them totally free or at very, very low cost to participate. Um, but politics is weighed up for a lot. I mean, we have towns in Indiana that have um, utility, like headquarters for um, veteran energy, for example, and it's really hard to get that mayor to, to make it happen. But we were, we're able to get, so Evansville, Indiana has a, has, is, is that city and we're able to get we found somebody who knew somebody who was a friend of the mayor and had them pitch that program and then we got them to participate and they're the most conservative city in the state of indiana that have now done a greenhouse gas inventory and are working on a climate action plan so again it's about connections and network but i mean a lot of it relies on politics um but what we're finding is that a lot of the um the majority of the populations even in small town indiana are supportive of uh, local governments preparing their communities for climate change. And so now we have that statistically significant survey data that we can present to the local governments and say, I know the rumor is that people in Indiana don't care about this, but it turns out they do. So we're here to help. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Britta. And thank you, Andrea. Uh, this really concludes uh, the webinar here at uh, two o'clock on the dot, maybe a minute longer, but um, Andrea, Naomi, and Kelly, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, your experience, and really some great advice to help people you know, advance their careers and do meaningful work. And so thank you for all you're doing, and uh, thanks for providing such great insight. Really appreciate it.
And thanks everybody for joining us on the, on the webinar series. So I, I know uh, Megan and Fana, Faina have other uh, opportunities coming forward. I'm sure you're gonna participate in those too and enjoy. Thank you all. Thank you so much everyone, um, especially Paul, Kelly, Andrea, and Naomi. Um, it was really great to hear your stories and I encourage everybody to connect on LinkedIn to continue the conversation. And um, we will see you all next week. Thank you everyone. Thank you.